Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to talk about some laws of limits or properties of limits, and we're going to drive these laws or, or prove them. So we're going to be writing some formal proofs of these laws and going over what some of them are. So the most uh, these laws here that we're going to look at have all of them have the same basic basic assumptions. The hypothesis is that if we take the limit as f of x approaches c, as f, limit of f of x as x approaches c, that limit exists, it is some real number l. And similarly, the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals some real number m. And actually these properties work whether the c is actually a real number, which is what this is saying, or c could be positive or minus infinity as well, that would be okay too. And we're going to let k, it shows up once in one of the properties, to be a real number constant, any real number constant. And here's what some of the limit properties say. The first one says that if we take the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus g of x, then that's the limit of f of x plus the limit of g of x, so it's l plus m. Now intuitively this should make some sense. Uh, if, if f is getting closer to L as X gets close to C and G is getting close to M as X gets close to C then the sum of those the sum here since it's just the sum of the F and the G should be getting closer to the sum of those limits intuitively it should be seem reasonable and in fact it is true we'll prove it in a minute uh, we take the limit as X goes to C of a constant times a function it's going to be a constant times the limit of the function, which of course is k times l. If we take the limit as x goes to c of f of x minus g of x, we, we uh, get the difference of the two limits. So the limit of the difference is the difference of the limits. The limit of the product is the product of the limits. The limit of a reciprocal is a reciprocal of the limit, provided that m is not zero. So if the, if, if the limit exists but it's zero, of course one over zero is undefined, so obviously that's not going to work. And similarly, the limit of a quotient is the quotient of limits, provided both these individual limits exist, and the one at the bottom, again, has to not be zero. If you take the limit of a function to a power, that's the limit of the function raised to the power, so that's going to be n to the little n. And this works for powers that are natural numbers, uh, no matter what, and it works for integer powers as long as the n is not zero. If the n, big N is zero, then zero, of course, to a zero power, zero to a negative power is undefined. So that's not going to work. And similarly, we take the, uh, the, the limit as uh, x goes to c of the nth root of f of x. That's going to be the nth root of the limit. Okay which is the nth root, nth root of n. Uh, and this one, I guess if we're talking strictly about real numbers, then we need to say, um, then we probably need to go ahead and say that and, uh, let's see, and n is greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero. Otherwise, we're taking the square root or the um, we could be taking an even root of a negative and then that would be it would give us a non-real answer here for a limit. We want to avoid that. We need to make sure either n is positive or zero or n could be negative if the root was an odd root. Okay, that would be okay too. Okay, so those are our basic properties, and again, they should seem fairly reasonable to you. But to uh, prove this, what we've got to do is we've got to um, somehow get our hands on the deltas and epsilons that we need and somehow manipul manipulate these things to make these proofs work out right. So let's start with this first one, and we want to prove it. So what we're going to basically do is we're going to show that there's a, given any epsilon, there's a delta that makes this limit work and a delta that makes this limit work, meaning makes the 
conditions in the definition of the limit work and we'll be able to work with that a little bit. So what we're actually going to do here, let's show you the proof. Here's the, here's the uh, entire proof here. So suppose we're given any value of epsilon greater than zero. Well, let's pick another value of epsilon. We'll call it epsilon two, which is the original epsilon divided by two. Since epsilon is a positive number, epsilon over two is another positive number. So that makes epsilon sub two a smaller positive number. Okay, now since the limit as x approaches c of f of x is l, by the definition of limit, there exists some positive number, we'll call it delta 1, such that if x is between c minus delta 1 and c plus delta 1, then f of x is between l minus epsilon 2, in other words, epsilon over 2, and l plus epsilon over 2. So this is the delta that goes with this second epsilon. And similarly, if we take the limit as x goes to c of g of x, since we know that exists and it's some value m, again, by definition, there's some delta 2 uh, positive number such that if c minus delta 2 is less than x, which is less than c plus delta 2, then m minus this epsilon, epsilon over 2, uh, is less than g, which is in turn less than m plus epsilon over 2. Now what we want to do is the delta that we want is going to be the smaller of the two, the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. Now, here we go. Suppose that c minus delta is less than x, which is less than c plus delta. Well, since delta is less than or equal to delta 1, that means c minus delta 1 is less than x, which is less than c plus delta 1. Okay, so in other words, uh, this this says this part right here says that x is within delta is close to close to c. How close? It's within delta uh, delta one. It's within delta one of it. Well, delta one is even delta is even smaller than that. So if it's within delta up here, then it's within delta one. And of course, it's within delta two because it's delta is less than or equal to delta two. And of course, this condition here. C being within delta of X being within delta of C says F of X is within epsilon over two of the limit L. And similarly, since since uh, X is within delta of C, it's within delta two of C. And so that puts the G of X within its limit, uh, within epsilon over two of its limit M. Now we have these two inequalities here. Uh, from the, from the two individual limits, and then we're just going to add corresponding parts. If this number, so if we take this one here, if we add something that's smaller, the smaller parts, the middle parts, and the greater, the, the larger parts, uh, property of inequality says that those will still be in the same order. So when we add these two, we get L plus M, and then minus epsilon over 2 plus uh, minus epsilon over 2 is minus epsilon. In the middle, we get F plus G. And on the right side, we get L plus M plus, these add up to epsilon. And so we've shown that F plus G is between L plus M plus epsilon and L plus M minus epsilon. So L plus M is our limit that we're looking for, and that's what we wanted to prove. So it's not, we just have to know our definitions with epsilons and deltas, and we have to be a little bit uh, clever here about picking the right modification of of uh, epsilon at the beginning here. We do a similar thing to prove property 2. So if k is 0, then k times f of x is 0 for all of a of x. So then when you're doing the limit of k times f of x, we're doing the limit of the function 0, which is certainly 0. And then k times the limit is, k is, is 0 times the limit, which is 0 times l, which is 0. So this does all work out just fine when k is 0. So the rest of the proof, we're going to assume k is not 0. Look at the more complicated case. Now suppose we're given any positive value epsilon that we want, that, that we're given. Now we're going to again, like the last one, get a new value of epsilon that's even smaller. This one's going to be epsilon over the absolute value of k. Now, k could be positive or negative, so we need absolute value here to make sure this is still a positive number. Okay, and so that epsilon 2 is a positive number. 
Now since this limit exists for f of x, as x goes to c, f of x approaches l, by definition there exists some delta greater than zero, such that if x is greater than c minus delta and less than c plus delta, then l minus this second epsilon, epsilon two, which is epsilon over absolute value of k, is less than x, which is in turn less than l plus the epsilon over absolute value of k, that has to happen, okay? So if c minus delta is less than x is less than c plus delta, then we have that inequality that we just said. What we want to do now is multiply all three sides of this by absolute value of k, and so now we have the inequality right here, absolute value of k times l minus epsilon is less than absolute value of k times f of x, which is in turn less than absolute value of k times l plus epsilon. Now we've already looked at what happens when k was zero, so we have two other choices. k could be positive or k could be negative. So if k is positive, the absolute value of k is just k, and so this last line becomes k times l minus epsilon is less than k times f, which is in turn less than k times l plus epsilon. If we have the k less than zero, then the absolute value of k is the opposite of k. So we have the opposite of k times l minus epsilon is less than the opposite of k times f of x, which is less than the opposite of k times l plus epsilon. Now we multiply all three sides by negative one that, and distribute, that's gonna get rid of the negative in the middle. Distribute here turns both these positive. Distribute here turns that one positive, that one negative but it also reverses the inequalities. Reversing it back to all less thans in order from smallest to larger, that smallest to largest, this one goes on the left, of course that one's still in the middle. This one over here is on the right, and in both cases we get k times l minus epsilon is less than k times f, which is less than k times l plus epsilon. So we showed for any epsilon that we started with up here, we know that there's a delta the one that comes from the same one that comes from this limit is going to work to make k times l minus epsilon less than k times f, which is less than k times l plus epsilon. So by definition, the limit of um, k times f is going to be k times l, which is k times the limit of f of x. Let's do one more. The next one we're going to do is we're going to prove property three, the limit of a difference is the difference of limits. This time, because we have properties one and two, I'm not going to have to go back to the definition of limit to do this. Um, we can just use property one and two pretty straightforward here. We're given that the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l, and the limit of g of x as x approaches c is m. By property two, where k is negative one, we know that the limit, since this limit g exists, the limit of g is m, we know the limit of negative one times g is negative one times the m. Now, f of x minus g of x is f of x plus negative one times g of x. So there's the limit of the sum by the property one the limit of the sum here is the sum of the limits provided these exist, but the limit of minus g we know exists because we just showed that right there. The limit of f of x is, is assumed to exist. And so this limit is l plus minus m, which is l minus m. And so that's what we wanted to prove. So we were able to prove in this video uh, the first three of these results. We'll prove some of the others in a subsequent video.